we now want to talk about the history of various kinds of fisheries in light of what we've been discussing about the the uh, economic principles behind uh, behind fisheries economics. So I want to start uh, with the with the book which discusses overfishing in the Philippines in box of uh, in box 15.2 and let me sketch a graph here um, it's a little hard to see in the textbook but basically the graph an approximate total revenue curve and an approximate total cost curve the axis is of course dollars. Now you you can't see that on the left, but if you look on the right of box 15.2, you can see that there, there there are actually two vertical axes on the right and one vertical axis on the left. And the the uh, the vertical axis that's the rightmost is in dollars. So it's basically the other ones are equivalent to dollars and what you can see that the data starts from 1946 goes to 1984 and what you can see is that the as time goes on you have data points let me just draw approximately what the data points are this isn't this isn't exact you can um, look on box 15.2 to get the to get the exact uh, picture but basically, in the beginning of the period, you had fairly, uh, fairly low fishing effort. So we've got effort here. And in the beginning of the period, um, fishing effort starts out fairly low. And then as time goes on, fishing effort increases, and you get data points that, that, run, like, that run like this. Uh, eventually, by the end, you get uh, data points that are around here or even somewhat beyond here. Now, the book illustrates two different fisheries. Here's the term they use, demersal and pelagic. A demersal uh, fishery is for bottom-dwelling fish, fish that stay on the bottom of the ocean, and they tend not to move very much. A pelagic fishery is fish that don't stay just on the bottom of the ocean and they uh, some pelagic species move many many miles even in the case of tuna uh, hundreds or even thousands of miles across the ocean so in any case in this uh, in box 15.2 this data from the Philippines they had both a uh, demersal fishery which is their graph on the top and a pelagic fishery which is their graph on the bottom but the the notion, of course, is that the open access point is is here, and this is essentially a historical data showing what we showed theoretically when we talked about open access fisheries, that eventually all the profit possibilities get dissipated because of increased effort. So that's the purpose of of this box is to show that the theoretical story can actually be found in in actual data. Next, let's see. We have the North Pacific fur seal fishery. Now, we use the word fishery because we're talking about a renewable resource that functions like a fish. Of course, fur seals aren't fish, they're mammals. So a biologist wouldn't want to hear you say a fur seal fishery, but I think you understand what we mean by it. And I'm going to read a passage from page 214 of your book, which says, talking about the fur seals, the resource was effectively an open access one with vessels from the United States, Canada, the Soviet Union, Japan, and the United Kingdom taking part. In the 1890s, massive exploitation occurred, followed by falling catches and many firms leaving the industry. Various attempts to curtail catches were made, 
culminating in a treaty in 1911 which regulated the catch and which still exists today. So that's the end of the quote. First let me point out there's an anachronism there. When they were listing the countries in the 1890s that were exploiting and over-exploiting the, the fur seals, they, they listed the Soviet Union. Of course, in the 1890s, it was Imperial Russia, not the Soviet Union. And one of the remarkable things about this treaty is, so the treaty was made between these countries, including Imperial Russia. The treaty still exists today, which means that it survived the Russian Revolution, the transition to the Soviet Union, and then in the 1990s, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So it's really quite remarkable. I think this is the the first uh, international treaty, at least that I'm aware of, that regulated uh, a renewable resource. And quite successfully, um, as your book points out, there was a rather well-known paper written in 1977 uh, discussing the, the fishery, and uh, it seems to be quite sustainable. So that, that treaty seems to have been quite successful. Our next topic here is fish wars. So in the 1960s, the, the in the North Atlantic, uh, Iceland is an important island in the North Atlantic, and Iceland has depended on on the cod fishery basically ever since humans um, settled Iceland about a thousand years ago. Cod is also an important fish for the fishing fleet of the United Kingdom. In the 1960s, both Iceland and the UK were NATO allies, but the Icelandic government was unhappy that there were so much British, so many British fishing vessels catching cod near the coast of Iceland. And so it started to object and there were conflicts. And at this time, I guess I should have mentioned there's another um, conflict here which I didn't, I didn't type. Instantly, there was also a conflict between the, the U.S. and the South American country of Ecuador. Because it used to be that countries could control fishing within three miles off their coast. And after three miles, it was open access. Now, Ecuador was not happy that the U.S. was sending fishing vessels to catch lots of fish just a little bit more than three miles off the coast of Ecuador. In the same kind of way that Iceland wasn't happy, that the UK was sending vessels to, to catch fish so close to the shores of, of Iceland. Now, the, the conflict between the U.S. and Ecuador happened earlier in the 1960s. The fish wars between Iceland and the UK happened later. What the Ecuadorian government did was to say that they were going to object to this rule that countries could only regulate fisheries within three miles off their coast. And they wanted to extend that to 200 miles off their coast. So for many years, the U.S. ignored this. The U.S. sent fishing vessels into this area. The Ecuadorian Navy captured some of them, towed them into port. They had to pay large fines in order to get the vessels uh, to be released. So there were these conflicts. And in, in the North Atlantic, there were conflicts between Iceland and the U.K. This conflict got so heated that at some points, uh, naval vessels from Iceland and the UK actually fired warning shots against uh, fishing vessels from the other country. What ended up happening as a result of these, these, uh, these two conflicts in the 1960s was Ecuador's idea that fish that country coastal coastal nations should be able to regulate fisheries for 200 miles started to become more and more and more popular and eventually all countries including the US adopted that 
and so now all the all the countries that that have ocean coastlines can regulate fisheries within 200 miles of of their coastline so that was a pretty big pretty big change from the 1960s to where we are today The next conflict I want to talk about is the cod crisis. So I already mentioned cod in relation to Iceland. The cod fishery is a really important fishery in the North Atlantic. Uh, some of you may know that if you look at a map of the New England part of the United States, one part of the state of Massachusetts juts out into the Atlantic Ocean and that's called Cape Cod. And the reason is because cod, the cod fishery is also really important in, in New England it's, and in the maritime provinces of Canada, which are the far eastern provinces of Canada. That's how Cape Cod got its name. In fact, when, the, when people like the Pilgrims first came to New England, there are stories that say that the cod was so abundant that you could actually walk uh, weighed out into the ocean from the shore with uh, something like a wicker basket and dump the basket into the water and catch cod that way. You didn't need, you didn't even need uh, boats. So, so cod was abundant for a long time and the economies of especially the eastern provinces of Canada but also the fishing industry in New England is heavily dependent on cod. And what happened is that in the 1980s, the Canadian government was regulating cod catches, and the I Canadian fishing industry kept wanting the quotas to be increased. They would say that they, that they are the ones, the, the fishermen are the ones that are really familiar with the fishery. They and their ancestors had been exploiting this fishery for hundreds of years. The quotas were being set by government scientists in the national capital who didn't have, they said, first-hand knowledge of, of the reality of the cod fishery. And these lobbying efforts were successful. And each year in the late 1980s, the government set the cod quotas somewhat higher than what their fisheries biologists recommended the cod quotas to be. This was seemed to be okay until the early 1990s. And in the early 1990s, over a period of something like two years, or maybe even less, there was a sudden collapse of the cod fishery. And this fishery, which humans had been exploiting for a thousand years in the in the other part of the Atlantic, and ever since the Europeans came to to the um, to the western part of the Atlantic, the the fishery collapsed. Uh, the The population size uh, crashed to I don't know something like ten percent of the previous population. All fishing had to end, and even now in 2020, there's not much fishing allowed. the The fishery really hasn't recovered. What happened shortly after the Canadians stopped all the cod fishing is an incident that's now called the turbot war. Turbot is a type of fish. Uh, these aren't cod, but these, these are also fish that are uh, caught in these waters. So Canada had jurisdiction over the waters 200 miles from the Canadian coast. What happened is that fishing vessels from the European Union, primarily from Spain, were fishing uh, for cod and I suppose turbot also something like 201 miles off the coast of Canada. So it was in international waters, but very close to the limit of Canadian jurisdiction. And clearly this activity was going to decrease the number of fish in Canadian waters as well. So this happened in the in the um, in the uh, around 1993, I believe. That's an approximate date. The Canadians got very unhappy 
that the European Union was doing this. And finally they got so mad that they sent Canadian naval vessels to seize the European fishing vessels, uh, tow them into Canadian port, and essentially hold them hostage. The European Union was quite aghast and said that the fishing vessels were operating in international waters, and nowadays with modern technology it's easy to determine whether that's the case or not and that it was the case. And the Canadians admitted that these vessels were operating in international waters, but said that they didn't want them operating this way in international waters, and they refused to release the vessels until the European Union sat down and negotiated a new treaty, which regulated fishing in international waters uh, in that part of the North Atlantic for cod. So we often, I think, uh, here in the U.S., imagine Canada as being a very peaceful country, but in this particular situation, the Canadians operated in a, in a very forceful manner and in a manner which, frankly, violated international law uh, in order to try to uh, preserve what was left of the, the fish stocks in, in Canadian waters. I think I'll stop this video here because we've already gone a, a long ways and then we'll continue with the next topic in the next video.